Take it away, Professor Harji. Okay, yes, this presentation will be recorded. If you do not want to be seen on camera, you can turn your cameras off. Welcome everyone to Artivism, the power of art for social transformation. Uh, we have with us today, Melina, Dr. Melina Giacumis. Uh, Melina Giacumis is the Associate Director of the Institute for Comparative Genomics at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, she completed a PhD, give me a minute, uh, in biology at the City University of New York in 2023, where she studied the population genomics and ecology of marine invertebrates and used that research for conservation planning. Melina is interested in wildlife management and science communication and was featured last year on a popular episode of The Story Collider. Melina is also Melina also completed an MA in conservation biology at Columbia University in 2013 and a BA in environmental studies and anthropology at Adelphi University in 2011. Uh, welcome, Melina. Thank you for being our artivist for today. Take it away. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, so today I'm going to be talking to you about some of my PhD work and some of the work I've been doing beyond that as well. Um, so mo mainly I focus on uh, marine invertebrates, um, as RG said, mostly on sea stars. So um, I'm going to be talking to you today about the conservation of sea stars here in the North Atlantic Ocean. And so we'll start here um, uh, at the Anthropocene. So has anyone ever heard this term before, the Anthropocene? Um, feel free to like pitch in, chime in if you have if you've heard of it, if you have a... a, a the definition um, doesn't sound like anyone does. So yeah, the Anthropocene is 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 a description of the current geological epoch that we're currently in, um, starting around the Industrial Revolution. So you know you may have heard of all these previous geological eras, right? The the Jurassic, the Pliocene, the Holocene. Now we are considered to be in the Anthropocene, and that's because we as people have done uh have made such a mark on uh the earth's surface uh, that it qualifies as a as its own geologic era um and this is a photo of strip mining uh, which is a very common thing that's done on the earth's surface and so um uh that it also includes the the impacts we've made in that uh have led to climate change Climate change is one of the main drivers of uh, what's known as the biodiversity crisis. Um, does anybody know what the biodiversity crisis is? <laughs> it's also sometimes called the sixth extinction. Um, so this is actually um, a current crisis again that we're going through and that is the loss of biodiversity. Uh, it is uh, happening at a pre precipitous rate across, across the world. Um, this is something that's happened five times before in Earth's history, which is why we call this the sixth extinction. But this is the most rapidly uh, changing uh, extinction event. Um, and so what that means is we're losing species at a rate that has, has never been uh, the case in, Earth, in Earth's history before. Yes, that includes the asteroid. <laughs> um, so... Here um, we have just a little figure that shows um, the rate of biodiversity decline from the 1970s when this started to be documented down to 2010. These are showing kind of uh, uh, projections of how biodiversity loss could continue to occur in the future. And so the business as usual um, without big changes to our current behavior is the gray. So that's probably what we're gonna see happen. But, you know, with increased conservation and more awareness and more sustainable consumption across the planet, um, we could um, uh, lead to, to, to implement big change. So um, I uh, study, as, we, as I've already said, I study marine invertebrates. And um, in particular, I study marine invertebrates that occur in the intertidal zone, so on the coast, in the areas between high and low tide. And marine coastlines are, are really ecologically and economically important parts of the ocean. Um, so they provide us with ecosystem services, um, which are, you know, 
exactly what they sound like. They're services that the environment provides to us free of charge. And if we mess them up, we have to start paying for them in another way. So one of the most important uh, uh, ecological services that the marine coastline provides us is um, buffering from storms. Uh, so should we you know, continue to develop our coastlines to be um, really beautiful housing, <laughs> um, we're gonna continue to need um, increased buffering from those storms. Um, and uh, another thing that marine coast, uh, those intertidal zones provide for us is a nursery for lots of economically important marine species. So this is a teeny tiny lobster. So I don't know if you know this, but when lobsters are babies, they look just like big lobsters, but they can fit on the tip of your finger. Um, and so uh, these kinds of economically important species need a safe place to live um, uh, that say protects them from bigger predator species that can't find, they, they can't survive in these shallow waters. Um, but uh, when these animals are really, really small. They live in these areas where don't, there aren't full of predators that can eat them. And so if, again, if we continue to develop these coastlines, these um, important regions are going to change and um, a lot of habitat for these species is, is going to go away. Um, even more specifically, I study animals in the rocky intertidal zone. So um, the, again, the area between high and low tide, um, uh, and in areas that have rocky shores. These areas are really, really difficult places for animals to live, right? They, they are periodically exposed to air and sunlight, um, but they also need to be adapted for the ocean, right? And so there's also area, uh, really high zonation in these areas, meaning that areas that are really, really close to land are have a, need a different set of adaptations that areas that are really, really closer to the ocean, right? They're, these animals don't really need to be as um, adapted to like be periodically exposed to sunlight, but they do need to be ex uh, adapted to high wave action, for example. And so all the animals that live in these areas are really, really unique because they have all these interesting adaptations. And there's also a really high diversity um, because there's such uh, uh, lots of, uh, different zones within this region. So for that reason, it's really important to conserve, right? It's highly diverse. Um, and these adaptations don't exist anywhere else. Within that rock in or tidal zone, my research mostly focuses on sea stars, which are considered a keystone species in the rocky intertidal. Um, and so a keystone species um, has anyone ever heard that term before? Maybe a show of hands. <laughs> um, so a keystone species is uh, a species that has a disproportionately large effect on the rest of their communities. Meaning that um, even though there might not be that many sea stars, um, they play a really big role in um, organizing and, uh, their community and in um, maintaining high diversity and stability. Um, and they do that by um, preferentially eating dominant competitors. So what do I mean by this? So if we look at this figure here, this picture, this, this is a rock um, that was photographed in the 1980s in Washington state. And you can see all these little sea stars on it, right? like all these orange patches are sea stars. This is the same rock um, uh, in, the, in 2010 um, and all the sea stars are gone. Um, but there's tons and tons of mussels, right? And so must sea stars prefer to eat mussels or whatever else is overpopulating. Um, and that means that um, if sea stars are not there, mussels will overpopulate and encrust on every available surface um, and crowd out all the other species. So the diversity of that ecosystem will go from, you know, 15 species to just one species mussels. <laughs> um, so sea stars are really, really important to conserve if we want to maintain a resilient, stable, and diverse ecosystem. But these regions are, these species are threatened by many things, including habitat degradation, climate change, and a disease called sea star wasting, which is something I'm going to get to a little bit later in this talk. So I study um, a group of sea stars in the genus Asterius. Um, there's three members of this genus. Two of them are here in the North Atlantic and one of them is in the Pacific. 
And just a little history about this: these two species in the North Atlantic. So um, there used to be an ancestral Asteria species just in the Pacific about three and a half million years ago. Um, this Atlant the this Pacific species made its way into the Atlantic, where it split into two separate species: one on the east coast of North America, Asterius forbsi, one on the um, in Western Europe, Asterius rubens. Asterius rubens from uh, in Europe colonized North America uh, at some point, and now they co-occur on a part of uh, the east coast of North America. And so um, on that east coast of North America, um, they've long been speculated to hybridize. Um, and so hybridization is um, when two separate species are able to breed together and produce offspring. Um, and so um, for a really long time, the, when these species had been studied, people thought that they might be hybridizing, but it was never documented um, uh, with genetic data. And so here are some of the estimates of where that hybrid zone was speculated to be over the years. Um, and so when I started my dissertation, I wanted to confirm whether or not this was actually happening um, in the wild. And so you might be thinking, you know, why would we even care if two random species of sea stars are hybridizing, right? Um, that's a really good question. It's something that I get in the scientific world every day. Um, and so there's a couple of reasons why we might care if sea stars are hybridizing. First, um, hybridization is sort of considered a, a window into evolutionary change. Um, it's uh, the beginning of some larger processes of um, how animals are distributed throughout the globe and how animals adapt to new environments. And so um, if some, for, if one of the species, for example, is more um, highly adapted to warm water, what does that mean? Is Are those warm water genes able to um, kind of migrate through the population? Only by studying their hybridization are we able to understand these processes better. The other interesting part of this question is that these hybrid zones might be shifting with our rapidly changing climate. Um, and so to get uh, one of the, the most exciting parts of this project was that we were able to get some more baseline data about how the hybrid zone is shaped right now and maybe how it's going to be shaped in the future. So I went out and I did a bunch of field work. Um, and so this is what it looks like to do sea star field work. Um, mostly it was me on the road in uh, my Subaru, um, uh, traveling up and down the east coast of North America. And so I went from Florida all the way up through Nova Scotia, um, looking for sea star samples. Um, and so, you know, sometimes I would just wade out into the low tide with my boots. Um, and sometimes I would snorkel out if, um, if the water was warm enough. Usually it wasn't warm enough. I even got hypothermia once. Uh, <laughs> I was okay, but it was a little scary. Um, and so, uh, you know, I would collect as many sea stars as I could find. I would take a couple of tube feet and then I would put them back. Um, so that all the sea stars survived <laughs> my project. Um, and so once the sea star samples were collected, I sequenced them um, and I was able to get genetic data for all of these sea stars. And so this... Um, it's just some of the data. Um, I'm not going to get, this isn't a genomics talk, so I'm not going to like really uh, bore you to death with genetic data. Um, but um, just uh, in case you haven't seen a figure like this before, probably you haven't. Um, each one of these vertical bars is um, representing one individual sea star. And the colors of the bars are showing um, percent ancestry from one species or another for each of those individual sea stars. So if a bar is, in complete, is completely orange, that means it this one sea star derived all of its genetic data from Asterius rubens, that European sea star. And if a bar is completely green, it derived all of its genetic data from Asterius forbsi, the southern nor uh, North American species here. Right now, you'll notice starting in about Massachusetts and Maine, there are individual sea stars that have like half and half, right, or even different levels of ancestry from each uh, each species, and those are our hybrids. So we're seeing hybridization occur from Massachusetts all the way up through Nova Scotia, 
um, and Prince Edward Island here. Um, and so, you know, we did all sorts of different kinds of, you know, tests on this data. We were, we looked at and to see, you know, how the environment is shaping this hybrid zone, all these things. Um, if you're interested in this, I can send you this paper that I wrote. Um, it's, it was published in Molecular Ecology earlier this year, and it has lots and lots of information about this hybrid zone and how the environment influences it. Another thing that we did um, was look a little deeper into the genomic data and see what parts of the genomes are more susceptible to hybridization. So actually on the genome, on the DNA sequence, which parts of those are more likely to be um, add, like mixed between the two species, um, which is a new kind of cutting edge form of research that a lot of people interested in hybridization are doing. And so what we're seeing here is each um, row is actually an individual C stars genome and each column is a site in the genome. So we're aligning these things by the site in the genome. So each base pair is aligned vertically. So what are we seeing here, right? There's, there's parts of the genome that are very, very distinct, right? There's parts of the genome that are, if you're from the South, it's all Asterius Forbes eye, green. Um, yeah, green. If you're from the North, it's all purple Asterius Rubens. But there's parts of the genome where it's a lot messier, right? There's like, there's chunks of DNA kind of floating around between these regions. And so one of the things we're doing next is to look at, you know, what is it, what is it about these ge genome portions that are more or less likely to be floating between the populations? Are they really important for function and they they can't be moved around, they can't be scrambled? Or um, are there parts of them that are, uh, uh, good for like warm water adaptation and they're more likely to be floating from south to north, you know? Um, and so that's something that we're focusing on um, on right now. Another interesting thing to show is um, there's one sea star here that seems to be a really um, ancient hybrid, meaning that like its hybridization event happened like de generations and generations ago. And we know that because all of the different um, admixed portions of the genome are really, really tiny. So they've been broken up by recombination over many generations. Um, and I promise that is the last genome -y thing I'm gonna talk about. <laughs> so if you didn't feel, follow it, you can breathe a sigh of relief. We're gonna be talking about more social stuff next. So I already told you guys that I did a bunch of field work, right? To, to, to get my samples, to sequence them, and look at this beautiful picture of a, sea, a bucket full of sea stars, right? Most of the time, my day did not look like this. This was, this happened maybe once, maybe twice. I got to a beach and there was a sea stars everywhere. Most of the time it was just a lot of this and not a lot of sea stars. In fact, there was one, uh, sea, there was one uh, field excursion that I went on that I drove all the way from New York down to Florida for weeks and I, and I hit almost every beach along the way and I found exactly zero sea stars. And I had to just sample sea stars from touch tanks at local aquariums. Um, and so when I was looking into this, these, this historical sea star literature, that was not what I had been expecting because there had been a sea star survey that had been done in the in the 1970s that showed that sea stars were highly highly abundant in the North Atlantic, in New England in particular, um, there were up to 20 sea stars per quarter meter squared. Okay, so just think about that for a second. 20 sea stars in a quarter meter squared, <laughs> just piled on top of each other, just carpeting the seafloor, right? Um, and I spent three weeks on the road and didn't find a single one, right? So something was going on here that no one had documented before. So I scrapped one of the chapters of my dissertation and I decided I wanted to go out there and document what was happening. So for, uh, for my third chapter of my dissertation, I wanted to recreate this 1979 survey of sea stars in New England. So I decided I wanted to go to all the exact same locations um, as Bruce Menge did in the 1970s and use his exact same protocols and directly compare 
how sea stars have changed um, in New England from then until now. So I got uh, the National Park Service uh, to fund this project. <laughs> so I went to them and um, I got a fellowship uh, called the Second Century Stewardship Research Fellowship. Um, they paid for me to um, to do this project, to resurvey. They also connected me to lots of other national parks and, and seashores in the area. And that I was allowed to sample all of these across all these national parks, which was a really great privilege. Um, and they also helped me to communicate this research to all of the wildlife managers in the region. So I'm really, really grateful and lucky to have been able to work um, with this with this fantastic group. So my methods for this um, for this project were to survey um, these species across New England, document and quantify the decline in these this group since 1979, and assess other changes in this group. So um, was there a qualitative difference um, between what people were seeing in the 1970s and now? And then finally, to try to figure out what was causing this decline and inform wildlife managers about it. So um, my survey locations ranged from Cape Cod all the way up through Northern Maine in, uh, in Acadia National Park. And so I worked at Cape Cod National Seashore, Boston Harbor Islands, Acadia National Park, and then a few other um, historical survey locations in between. So that meant more field work. And this field work was different. Um, so I, for this field work, I would lay down what we call a belt transect, which is really just a rope. <laughs> and I would, um, it was a measured rope that was like five meters long. And I would search along this rope, one meter on either side for all the sea stars that I could find. Um, and so I would do that five separate times at the intertidal. So, um, you know, right at the shoreline at low tide. And also I would do that with snorkel gear um, about 20 feet offshore. And I did this with um, a couple of uh, field assistants. So I'm really grateful to them, um, Andrea um, Calderon, who's now doing her own PhD uh, in New Orleans at Tulane and Maya P Pelletier, who um, ended up working at the Scudic Institute in Acadia National Park um, after, after I trained her on some field methods. So um, that's one of the most fun parts of the job of being a marine biologist is sort of spreading the knowledge, right? Training other uh, women uh, who have never done field work before and how to do it um, themselves. So um, for this project, um, you know, it was a lot of early mornings. We were get we had to rush out to the shore at low tide. Um, often between four, four and five in the morning um, and lots of cold, <laughs> uh, cold water, lots of uh, long days. So uh, it was a lot of fun, but a lot of hard work. And so here's some of the data that we collected for, um, for this project too. So um, this is our density data um, between 1979 and 2021. So the top figure is our density data from 1979. So just that same Mengi data just plotted in night from 1979. And um, this is my current density data. Now, what I really want you to, to see here <laughs> um, is um, that these cannot be plotted on the same graph because the scales are so different. Even when I log, log transform this data, it can't be put on the same graph. This top figure, right, is our historical density. And that goes all the way up to 20 sea stars per quarter meter squared. The bottom axis there, the y-axis, it can it only goes up to 0.1 sea stars per quarter meter squared is our maximum density, right? So that's, we're talking orders of magnitude of decline, right? In the past, we would find up to 20 sea stars per quarter meter squared. And now we find at most 0 0.075 sea stars per quarter meter squared in the inner tidal. Okay. The other thing I want you to notice here is that we have it separated by intertidal, so that shallow water in gold and subtidal in blue. And so what else are we seeing here, right? Um, we're seeing a lot more subtidal sea stars than intertidal sea stars. Whereas in the past, these things were more likely found and more reliably found in the inner tidal. 
So this is our current density. Um, so I wanted to plot this separately because there I ran, went to some sites that were not um, not visited in the original paper. I actually did a little bit more of a survey than he did. Um, and so what are, what else are we seeing here? Um, there's one or one site that we're seeing a lot higher density, right? That pretty marsh in Acadia National Park. It has about a density of about 0.6 sea stars per quarter meter squared, whereas everywhere else we don't even come close to that. Um, it's still way, way less than they found in the past, right? Way less than 20. It's only 0.6, um, but it's still higher than most than most places um, that we're seeing. And so, um, the uh, uh, another thing that I that I did for this project was I wanted to look at what uh, what was the size distribution of sea stars um, now compared to what it was in the past. One of the things that the original surveyor noticed was that most of the time the vast majority of sea stars that he found were really, really small. <laughs> they were called recruits and they were baby sea stars, right? And so what does that tell us about this population? Um, they um, breed like crazy or they used to, right? <laughs> there, used, there used to be tons and tons of tiny sea stars. They were always the largest size class. So these darker bluer colors are all smaller sea stars, right? So this is the proportion of individuals in each size class on the y-axis. And these are just different sites um, that he visited and over, over time um, on the x-axis. So um, we're seeing that there's lots and lots of small sea stars in the 1970s all the time, no matter what time of year he visited and surveyed these beaches. I found something different. So there, most of the time, you know, some of the time these baby sea stars were the biggest size class, but a lot of the time, the biggest sea stars were the biggest size class. <laughs> so what does that tell us about what's going on here, right? Something must be disproportionately affecting small sea stars. What does that mean for this population? Possibly that, you know, they are unable to get past their smallest size class. Um, they, you know, maybe it's, maybe there's something going on with the temperature of the water. Maybe there's something going something more going on with resource availability, um, that they aren't able to just grow past a certain size um, or they die off before they reach a certain size. But once they do reach a certain size, they're able to sustain um, themselves a little bit better. And so what we're seeing is some real qualitative differences between the populations of the 1970s and now. So <laughs> what is the answer to my big question? Where did all the sea stars go? First, um, I've established that sea stars are declining, right? By order, orders of magnitude, that's very obvious. They are also possibly shifting into the subtitle, into what is it? Colder water, right? So we know that the global, the, the ocean is warming. It's possible that these sea stars are just shifting into deeper water because that's the only water they can tolerate anymore. So sea stars have always been known to have a patchy distribution, but it seems to be getting even patchier, meaning that there's only pockets of um, available habitat anymore. Um, so, you know, sea stars are, have always been sort of suspected as being very picky about where their habitat is, um, but uh, it might be getting even worse. Um, their size distribution seem to have shifted with fewer recruits represented, as I've already discussed, and um, I'm going to also outline a few um, reasons for this decline, possible reasons for this decline. So first, um, uh, one of the major changes that's happened in um, the North Atlantic intertidal is the green crab invasion. So green crabs have invaded from Asia um, and they've completely overturned the, the intertidal of the North Atlantic. So they've eaten a lot of the resources that used to be sea star resources. So that's one of the big reasons that I think um, sea stars are just not able to sustain large numbers anymore. Sea stars are just eating all their food. I mean, sorry, green crabs are just eating all their food. Another reason is climate change. So the Gulf of Maine, where the heart of the sea stars habitat is, is fast is warming faster than 99% of the rest of the ocean. Um, it's always been this pocket of really cold water. Um, and it's also, so for that reason, there's been lots of species that are only found there. Um, but now um, that's warming really, really quickly. 
finally, um, there's a way, there's a disease um, called sea star wasting um, that is, has always affected sea stars on the West coast, or, you know, it's, it's been known to affect sea stars on the West coast for a really long time. Um, but just got documented here on the East coast a few years ago. Um, it's likely that this has been affecting sea stars on this coast for longer than that, but we just haven't ha been documenting it. Um, not as many people study marine invertebrates on the East Coast. Um, so it's possible we just haven't been paying attention. Um, but we, the big problem with sea star wasting is we don't know what causes it. <laughs> it could be linked to a virus, but the, it doesn't seem to be definitive. Um, there is some evidence that warmer waters are leading to more proliferation, more pervasive and severe outbreaks of this virus. Um, and um, this is something that is likely affecting the populations of these species. So what can we do? What is the future of these species? Um, first, the magnitude of this decline. I know it's a bummer, it's staggering, but it's now documented um, and now it's been quantified so we can, for the first time, move forward, right? With trying to figure out what to do about it. So that's the good news. Um, the next steps for this um, would be a community level study um, uh, documenting this wider change across intertidal species. Um, and that's something I'm working on um, as one of my next uh, papers. Um, also, uh, another thing that I'm working on doing um, in the future is collecting baseline data on sea star wasting outbreak locations, as well as severity of these outbreaks. Sorry, one second, my computer's dying, so I'm just gonna plug myself in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so one of the one of the main things I'm really interested in doing now is again collecting baseline data on sea star wasting outbreaks. So as I mentioned, this has always been a West Coast problem. It's something that people thought only occurred on the West Coast of North America. Um, we know almost nothing about this here on the East Coast. So um, I want to start collecting that information. So people anecdotally tell me, oh, yeah, I saw a bunch of sea stars. They were wasting. They were melting. They had these lesions on them. But no one has ever written that down and given us uh, so that we have an idea of where this occurs and when. So I'm building an, an app um, for people to report when they see this happening. Um, my, the name of the app is still up for debate. You know, if you have any good ideas for what we should call this app to be compelling, I'm happy to entertain them. Right now I'm going with Seeking Sea Stars. People can um, at, report when they see a sea star and when they see a sea star wasting. Um, so I'm building that with AppSheet and um, it's in beta mode already. So it's much easier to build an app than you think. <laughs> um, so that's something I'm working on and I'm really excited about sharing. Another next step is working with wildlife managers across the national parks and seashores. Now that I have a working relationship with a lot of these groups to create a conservation plan for these species. Now that we know they've declined so much, we can work on um, moving forward with, with conserving them and their, and their habitats. And finally, I'm working on spreading the word about this. So um, I, as um, RG mentioned, I was featured on an episode of Story Collider um, which is a radio show kind of like um, The Moth. Uh, it features only science stories. So I did a live uh, storytelling event up in Acadia National Park, and then they featured me on, on the podcast. Um, and so I've got, I got a lot of people's awareness about this problem in, uh, at that time. I was also recently featured on a French-Canadian radio show talking about the same. Um, and I also do lots of things like Skype a scientist and this <laughs> to start spreading the word about about sea stars um, and, and their plight across the North Atlantic. So that's all I have. Um, and with that, I'll take any of your questions uh, about this work. OK, before we go to questions, um... If you are interested in presenting at Artivism, you can email us at artivism at adelphi.edu. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Artivism for Shared Humanity. You can watch past um, presentations on our YouTube channel, again, Artivism 
for a shared humanity. Thank you, Melina. Um, next week, Monday, November 13th, Professor Abby Emerson will present Art Methodologies for Freedom, Healing, and Understanding in Teaching and Research, and discuss how inviting a visual arts-based practice into her research helped make it a space where freedom, healing, and understanding were possible. Carolina? Thank you. I'll take a second here to thank our presenter today. Thank you for the research and for taking interest in uh, researching this particular topic. I, one question that came to mind was, um, you know, in, in here in Artivism, we have had artists presenting about the pollution of the waters throughout the world also, right, in various forms, be it the oil spill that we had. And I know that certain bodies of water, of water might not connect with others, of course, but uh, we were just talking about the other day about all this pollution that is happening also in Ghana, right, in waters. And my question is, how could all this perhaps microplastics or new chemicals that are in the environment throughout the world, like I mentioned, in various modes, in various bodies of water, could potentially be reaching this section that you're currently studying. And you know, it is a global a global situation based on our consumption methods, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so um, there's a couple of different thoughts I have about about that. Yeah. So, um. Each pollutant has its own separate impact, right? And so one of the things um, that I worked on um, as part of the paper, molecular ecology paper that I mentioned was we were looking at to see like what environmental factors influenced where we found each of these species. And then it turned out that um, a lot of the nutrient-based um, environmental factors, so things like nitrates, silicates, um, what else? Uh, I don't know. There's a, a iron, like things like that. They influence most where we find these animals. And so what does that tell us, right? When we, in, when we have flowing nitrates, like things from like fertilizer, right? <laughs> flowing into the ocean, um, it really impacts what, where animals are able to live, right? They, so, most animals only can tolerate a certain range of certain nutrients. Um, and if we're changing that balance, that's going to impact where we find these animals. Um, and so, you know, that's, uh, that's one thing. And, and also as far as like microplastics, plastics and, and things like that, um, you know, these sea stars, uh, are pretty low on the food chain. Um, they are predators of the inner tidal, but they're not like big, you know, sharks or something in which, you know, the accumulation of plastic throughout the, um, food chain is going to impact them um in in that way but um there are there is some evidence that um some of the uh, sea star wasting could be uh some sea stars might be more susceptible to sea star wasting in places in which um there is high pollution and that's because their immune systems are uh lowered right they're just like not as healthy and so they can't fight off whatever it is that's causing this problem um so yeah there's lots of there's lots of different ways in which this can be, um, this this impacts sea stars. Like, thanks for your question. There are many I, I questions. To that. Yeah, yes. I have a, I have a follow up actually. <laughs> um, it, um, oh my goodness. Okay, hold on a second. I just lost my train of thought. Um, let me. Okay, hold on. Give me a second. I'll be back. There are some questions in the chat also until Carolina yeah. comes back. Um, what, are some, thinking... what are some of the ways we can help from home? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there's there's a lot, a lot of ways that you can help from home. Um, I think that there's um, first, like once this app is introduced, you know, you're welcome to join it. And, and if you're ever at the beach and you see a sea star, you know, just report it. And that'd be really, really helpful. Another thing that a lot of citizen scientists, we call them, like to do is, you know, go on to iNaturalist. And like, if you're ever out, you see an animal that um, you, you you can report it in the app. And scientists actually use that data to um, 
better understand where species are, are distributed. And so I actually used a bunch of iNaturalist data to build what I call species distribution models. So that's one interesting way you can be an active participant in the scientific process. Um, but one of the other things that you can do, just like on a smaller scale, if you're concerned about climate change, um, which is like the main way in which we can help, is, you know, just make small changes in your lifestyle. One of the main main ways in which a person can help um, reduce climate change is by, by not eating beef. That makes a bigger difference to the environment than driving uh, an electric car, actually. And so that's one of the main things you can do. Uh, another thing that you can do is um, limit your air travel. Um, air travel is a huge, um, is, is the other main way in which an everyday person um, can, uh, can reduce their carbon footprint. Um, so those are the two big ones that I like. Oh, and if you're concerned about marine things in particular, um, then you can download the Monterey Bay Seafood Watch app. Um, and, the, and when you're at the grocery store shopping for your seafood, just uh, input what you are thinking of buying and it'll tell you if it's like a, uh, an environmentally conscious choice. That's a good question. Thanks. Carolina, you got your thoughts back? On a, on a different path, but yes, because I was really um, struck uh, when you began your presentation with the layers of mm -hmm. history and how ours is now the Anthropocene, right, that we are in, that mm -hmm. has the word in it, human, right, anthro. Um, mm -hmm. And I was thinking about that the other day, right, throughout history, and please correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, like, which other species has created so much damage to the environment <laughs> apart from humans, right? None. Exactly. <laughs> and and in, in, in the limited amount of time that we have been on Earth, correct? Because compared to other species, we're like super babies. Uh, yeah. But like that question that came before, right? What can we as humans do? But it, that so much is out of our control per se. But here in Artivism, we have touched upon how your purchasing power can affect what you do, like what you mentioned, which, by the way, could you ex explore a little more what you mean by the beef part of it? I can understand the uh, air travel, but by beef, can you, you know, tell us a little more why that is such a big impact? And in regards to my overall comment, it's uh, looking ahead, right? Like that graph that you showed, as if we don't change our habits or major habits, that decline of the biodiversity. And that's only in a sector or throughout the world? No, that's, um. so the reason why that is, um, it's really interesting actually. So um, does anybody know what like the main uh, greenhouse gases are? Anybody? <laughs> so one of the main ones you hear about is carbon, carbon, right? Uh, <laughs> that one is the, the one that we're always, you know, outputting in our cars and we're using gas and like all these things. And, but actually, um, methane is another really big greenhouse gas. Um, and it's four times more effective at trapping heat than carbon is. So while carbon is like way, way, way more abundant than methane, the, the smaller amount of methane that we output is actually, um, uh, more, more effective at trapping heat. And so, uh, uh, cows actually um, output tons of methane, uh, just like in their daily lives. They have all these chambers in their stomachs. Their digestion process leads them to output methane. And so um, uh, that's one of the main reasons. That's one of the reasons that that cows are, are terrible uh, for the environment or they're not terrible for the environment, like as individuals, it's not their fault. Right. But, you know, uh, the demand for so much beef is one of the main reasons that that's um, uh, a big issue. Um, and the other thing is just in general. So if you eat further down on the food chain, um, you have a smaller climate impact, right? Because as uh, when you start for if you if you eat plants, um, the plants are getting their energy from the sun, and then you just eat them, right? But if you eat something that eats plants, it needs to eat a lot of plants to build its muscle, right? And so you lose 90% of energy as you move your way up one level of the food chain. And so if you move up a second level of the food chain, like cows, <laughs> then you're getting even more loss uh, of energy. And so it takes tons and tons and tons and tons of plants to build like a pound of beef. 
Whereas like it built, it, it only requires like a little amount of plants to build a pound of like chicken. And so even just switching from beef to chicken, you're actually um, making a big difference. Um, you don't need nearly as much energy to build a pound of the meat that you're eating. Um, does that make sense to everybody? Uh, yeah. So that's one. those are the reasons why um, cutting out beef is like one of the biggest, biggest things you can do for the environment. I, it's not a commonly suggested thing, I know, but it's true. There it's also good for you <laughs> to not eat it, right? So when there, there are many questions that ask how you got into the star uh, starfish, but one that is interesting was what was, and it'll probably answer most others, what was the most heartbreaking thing you saw or something that triggered you in a way to keep you motivated in the starfish? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, it's been a long road. <laughs> um getting here um but one of the main things um that motivated me so I did um so I when I was from when I was little I would visit family in Greece um so my dad was born in Greece my mom's parents were born in Greece um and I would go to uh the island that I'm from in Greece uh where most of my family there um on my dad's side are fishermen and over and I would go, I would snorkel, I would see lots of octopus and fish and all these things. And then as I was growing up, I wasn't seeing any fish. <laughs> and then as I was got gotten even older and I was in college, I was talking to my family who were fishermen and like they weren't catching fish. And so um I watched kind of through my lifetime as the fishery collapsed in the Mediterranean. And so that kind of motivated me to to pursue a career in marine conservation. Um, and then sea stars in particular, you know, it just sort of fell into that group, but I actually really like it. I like to say, you know, sea, uh, invertebrates aren't very charismatic, but sea stars are kind of like as charismatic as they get. People get excited when they see a sea star. They don't get as excited when they see a sea slug, right? So <laughs> a cool group to study. <laughs> and there was one, uh, a follow-up on the beef. What about dairy products? Um, so yeah, the, the dairy products are different. Um, you know, um, it's, you still have that demand for like lots of cows being available. Right. But it's not that there isn't that same, um, transfer up the food chain. Right. So like one cow can just like pump out lots of milk. And so, um, you know, that's, uh, it doesn't have quite the same climate impact as actually eating beef. Um, it's more on the level of like eating chicken or something. That's a good question. I see another one here on the uh, chat that says, uh, could you tell us uh, what we can do about saving the coral reef? Coral reef. Oof, that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot. Uh, this is a loaded question. There's a, there's a lot to uh, that can be done um with the coral reefs but it's really really tough to reverse what's already been happening for a coral reef so unfortunately there's like some there are some things that can be done on a higher level than you and me right that um, like people are starting to like um, genetically engineer coral and like implant coral to like help rebuild coral reefs that are already gone um so i guess what you can do for that is maybe donate to those causes um uh because corals are already in a lot of trouble, unfortunately. Yeah, maybe ch you guys should check out that movie, Chase Chasing Coral. It's a really good one. Uh, it kind of talks about this and outlines some things that you can do as well. There is one also, will, do you consider that perhaps will sea stars ever go extinct? Well, um, actually there's like hundreds of species of sea stars. So probably not all sea stars. Um, you know, they're, they're even, they're in like the deep ocean, right? They're all over the ocean. And so probably not all sea stars. These sea stars in the North Atlantic is getting a little close. So possibly. <laughs> now that you mentioned higher levels, I was also wondering about how the um, Museum of Natural History is affecting, if so, policy. Um, the Museum of Natural History is affecting their policies on what? Policy, like environmental policies. Are they lobbying? Are they involved in the conversations at that kind of governmental level? You know, 
any of that discussion in regards to more political angle on, mm. on the conversation because sometimes as individuals we can do as much but if the government doesn't get behind big corporations and changes their way of doing business right then yeah so actually the museum does not lobby you know we're not a um advocacy uh focused institution we're a research institution um and so no they haven't really been involved in that um because we are again uh we're scientists we're supposed to remain unbiased a lot of us do you know when we research things like conservation um we are we advocate for changes um to be implemented to conserve our species of concern um but the museum itself does not get involved in policy change um so, um, but that being said, we do have a center for biodiversity conservation there um, that does study, ex does exclusively study conservation of different species. So we are involved in the conservation world, um, but not on a political level. You could read some of the chat, Melina. There are some interesting sure. um, um yeah, there are comments. I can Let's... email them to you as well. Sure, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, um any other like questions? How small a baby lobster is. Yeah. I know. I so love cute. it. I love it. <laughs> I've only seen them a couple times that tiny. Um and the little starfish. Them. I love it. Oh yeah, we have a little I found little teeny tiny starfish that can fit on the tip of my finger. So um so uh, the app. Um, uh, there was a question about the app that I'm developing. If it's mm -hmm. intended for students, scientists, or just anyone at the beach, is the goal to just get more information about sea stars or to encourage more people to become interested in this topic? That's a really good question. It's intended for anybody. And I would really love to um, encourage more people to be interested in the topic. So there's this really um, fantastic science communicator. Actually, she's here in Philadelphia, Sarah McAnulty. She studies squids and mm -hmm. she is like, gets people excited about squid all the time and she does this thing she does called squid facts and if she puts stickers up all over philadelphia with her phone number <laughs> and is she or you know a phone number and it says you know text this number for squid facts and she gets texts all day long for uh, like people just like give me a fact about squids and she just texts them a fact about squids and so, you know, people do get excited about these types of things um, if you just put an a little bit of effort in to communicate it with them. And so, you know, I would really love this information, right? Where are these sea stars and are they sick? Um, but in return, I think it would be fun, like for this app to optionally, of course, you know, maybe give you a fact about sea stars every once in a while or like, you know, give you tips on like, if you're out on in the intertidal, like what kind of animals can you hope to see? And like, what are your best, where are the best places you can look for them and things like that. Um, and so it's a, that would be like a bigger project, I think. Um, but um, it's something that I'm thinking about um, in the future. Any other questions or comments? We're good. Carolina, would you like to do your takeaway and close? Oh, yes. Thanks again for sharing uh, your passion with us and getting us going. You know, uh, that is like I read here, someone mentioned it's crazy how little awareness there is about marine conservation and how vital mm -hmm. it is, given that more than what is it, 70 something percent of the earth is uh, water, right? But um, here in Artivism, we have the tradition of closing each presentation with a key takeaway for action. What will be your key takeaway for today's audience for action? Hmm, my key takeaway for action. I guess um, one of the key things I hope you remember, I guess, about this presentation is, you know, an animal doesn't need to be big and charismatic and, um, you know, have a face. <laughs> to be important and to be um neat, like deserve to be conserved right and so um that's what i hope everyone takes away is you know all even the little things that you don't think about on your day to day have a place and are sometimes really really important
Okay, thank you, Melina. Um, thank you to our sponsors, Sync for Hope, Adelphi University, Goddesman Libraries Teachers College at Columbia University. Thank you, Carolina and Dr. Stephanie Lake, and to everyone here. Um, hope to see you all back. I will email you the chat because there are some that came in also. Um, thank you so much, Melina. Keep going. And you know what? Just because you're a woman doesn't mean you can't do these things. <laughs> I know. Yep. And I have, have a baby. <laughs> yes. With yes. I have a four month old baby. She was on my lap just now, but now, yeah, my now dad has her. So <laughs> <laughs> still chugging away. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Be well. Bye-bye.